We've been planning this camping trip since winter. Finally, we're here, away from the honking cars, the crowded streets, and the never-ending work emails. The group consists of me, Morgan, Mark, Autumn, and Ben. We've all been close friends since college and have been talking non-stop about this weekend escape to reconnect with nature and each other. We arrive at our chosen camping spot early in the day, unload our gear from the car, and start hiking. The forest is a maze of trees, their leaves creating a canopy overhead that filters the sunlight into dappled patterns on the ground. The air smells clean, filled with the scent of damp soil and growing things. Every step we take on the forest floor feels cushioned, the earth yielding softly under our hiking boots. As we move deeper into the forest, the trail we're on becomes less defined. Mark, who is at the front of our line, suddenly stops and points ahead. Look at that. Do you see it? He asks. We all squint in the direction he's pointing. Nestled between trees, almost as if hiding, is something that catches our collective attention. It's a cabin, its wood weathered and aged, but still standing. The windows are cracked and dirty making it hard to see inside. The door is slightly ajar, swaying gently in the wind as if inviting us to explore. The cabin itself seems to be a forgotten relic, a piece of history overtaken by the forest. Vines crawl up its sides and leaves are piled up against its foundation. As we approach, it's clear that the cabin has been empty for a long time. The wood creaks under our weight as we step onto the porch, Morgan is the first to push the door open. It resists at first, sticking as if uncertain, but finally gives way with a groan. We step inside cautiously, our eyes taking a moment to adjust to the dim light filtering through the dirty windows. The cabin is one large room, filled with furniture that is old and worn. There's a table in the middle, surrounded by chairs that have seen better days. On one wall, there's a fireplace filled with ash. A few scattered belongings are here and there, a rusty lantern, a chipped mug, and an old blanket folded neatly on a wooden chest. Ben's eyes fixate on a worn journal that lies on a table made from planks of wood supported by stacked cinder blocks. The cover is faded and tattered, suggesting age and neglect. He walks over, picks it up, and opens it. The pages are yellow, and the ink is smudged in places, but the writing is legible. He starts to read aloud. It says here that there's a creature in the forest, roams around at night or something. The writer even made sketches here. Ben turns the journal around to show us rudimentary drawings of a figure with elongated limbs and sharp features. Morgan, who's standing near a window, rolls her eyes and shakes her head. It's probably a joke or someone with an overactive imagination. I mean, People hear a raccoon rustling in the trash and think it's a monster, she says. Yeah, I agree with Morgan, I chime in, leaning against a wooden post that helps hold up the sagging ceiling. Look, the forest is full of sounds, especially at night. Owls hoot, deer rustle through the brush, and the wind makes the trees groan. Any of that can be creepy if you're not used to it. We shouldn't let some random journal dictate how we enjoy our trip. Mark who has been poking around a rusty metal cabinet in the corner, joins the conversation. But don't you think it's at least worth considering? Autumn, sitting on one of the creaky chairs near the table, shrugs her shoulders. Maybe it's some kind of local lore, or someone's attempt at storytelling, who knows? But we can't deny it adds a layer of mystery to our trip. Ben closes the journal, places it back on the table, and looks at each of us. Mystery or not, it's getting late. We should head back to camp before it gets dark. As we leave the cabin and make our way back through the forest to our campsite, I can't help but think about the journal. Despite my earlier dismissal, the unknown story behind those handwritten pages sticks with me. But for now, the goal is to get back to our tents, start a fire, and focus on the trip we've all been looking forward to. We follow the trail of broken twigs and footprints we had left earlier. Soon enough, we reach our campsite. Morgan, who is experienced in outdoor activities, quickly takes charge of setting up the campfire. 
she arranges logs in a pyramid shape and skillfully lights the kindling beneath. Within minutes, a fire is crackling, and we all gather around it, eager for the heat it provides against the cooling air of the evening. With skewers in hand, we roast sausages and corn over the open flames. The scent of cooking meat blends with the smoky aroma of burning wood, filling the campsite with a comforting smell. Ben brings out a bag of marshmallows, suggesting that we make s'mores later. Everyone nods in agreement, already looking forward to it. As the sky shifts from twilight to darkness, making the stars visible above us, Mark decides it's the perfect time for storytelling. Clearing his throat, he begins, So there was this one time when... His story is cut short by an unsettling noise. It's not the kind of sound you'd dismiss. It's a low, deep growl that seems to come from a distance, yet makes us all turn toward the forest edge. The firelight casts moving shadows on the trees, making it hard to see anything clearly. What was that? Autumn's voice wavers as she speaks, her eyes wide with a mix of curiosity and concern. Probably just an animal, Ben offers hesitantly, peering into the darkness as if expecting to see something emerge. Morgan, holding her skewer like a weapon, questions, Animals like what? Bears? Wolves? Her tone indicates she is not entirely comfortable with any possibility. I attempt to calm the atmosphere. Look, we're all together, and we have a fire going. Most wild animals are wary of humans, and especially fires. But as the words leave my mouth, I realize I'm also trying to convince myself. My eyes meet Morgan's, and I can tell she's thinking the same thing. The evening continues, but the mood isn't the same as before. Where there was once laughter and easy conversation, now there's a sense of unease. Odd noises continue to pierce the air from time to time, snarls, distant howls, or rustling that doesn't fit the pattern of wind through leaves. Each sound makes us glance nervously at each other, silently confirming that we all heard it. My concern escalates with each unfamiliar noise. Finally, unable to dismiss my growing worry, I break the silence. Okay, look, let's throw some extra logs on the fire to make it burn brighter, and maybe we should all stick close to the tents tonight. Just to be safe, I suggest, picking up a few thick logs from our wood pile and placing them onto the fire. The flames rise, casting a broader circle of light around the campsite, Everyone nods in agreement. Nobody voices it, but we're all thinking the same thing. Better safe than sorry. One by one, Morgan, Mark, and Ben zip themselves into their tents, the sound of the zippers cutting through the night air. Autumn remains outside with me, both of us staring into the fire as if it holds the answers to our questions. The flames flicker and dance, their light playing on her face, highlighting her worried expression. You're concerned too, aren't you? She finally asks, her voice softer than usual. Yeah, I admit, stirring the fire with a stick to keep it burning strong. She looks at me with serious eyes. We probably should have paid more attention to what that journal said. I was thinking the same thing, I confess. Let's agree to stay alert for the rest of the night. Maybe we can even set up some shifts to keep watch. I'll take the first one. Autumn nods, her face showing a mixture of relief and resolve. Sounds like a plan, she says, standing up to head to her tent, but pausing for a moment to look back. Let's hope it's just our imaginations running wild. I nod, but as she disappears into her tent, and I sit there alone, watching the fire and listening to the increasingly dark and silent forest around us, I can't shake the feeling that we are not alone. As Autumn retreats to her tent, I sit close to the fire, stoking it to keep the flames alive and bright. The wood crackles and pops, comforting sounds that contrast with the unsettling noises we've heard earlier. I find myself straining my ears, trying to pick up any sound that seems out of place. An hour goes by without incident, and just when I begin to relax, thinking perhaps we've overreacted, another low growl reverberates through the forest. It's distant, but distinct, 
and it sends a shiver down my spine. I decide it's time to wake Autumn for her shift. Gently unzipping her tent, I find her already awake, lying in her sleeping bag with her eyes open. I couldn't really sleep, she confesses. Your turn, I tell her, offering her the large flashlight we'd brought along. She takes it, nods, and comes out to sit by the fire while I retreat to my tent. As I lay there, staring at the fabric ceiling, the thought that we might not be alone keeps me alert, my mind racing through various scenarios. Eventually, fatigue takes over, and I drift into a shallow sleep, full of dreams that blur with reality. I am jolted awake by a sudden shout. Hey, everyone, wake up! It's Autumn's voice, tinged with urgency. I scramble out of my sleeping bag, unzip my tent, and join the others who are already gathering around the fire. I saw something moving between the trees, Autumn says, pointing with the flashlight into the dense foliage beyond our campsite. It was too big to be a small animal. Mark, ever the skeptic, squints into the darkness. Are you sure it wasn't just a shadow? These trees can play tricks on your eyes, especially at night. Despite his words, he keeps a firm grip on a sturdy branch he's picked up as an improvised weapon. We spend the rest of the night in a heightened state of alertness, our conversations subdued and our eyes frequently scanning the dark perimeter of our campsite. The fire becomes the center of our world, its light a barrier we hope is enough to keep any lurking dangers at bay. We're up with the first rays of sunlight, way earlier than any of us wanted. Last night's events are still fresh in our minds. I unzip my tent and step out into the cold morning air. My eyes meet those of Mark and Autumn, who are both standing next to their tents with looks of disbelief. What's happening? I ask as I walk over. Check this out, Mark says, his finger pointing to a series of deep claw marks that have torn through the fabric of his tent. Autumn gestures to her tent, which has the same ominous markings. What could have done this? We need to leave. Now, I say, my heart racing. Our focus turns to our immediate safety. The car is parked half a mile away, and getting there becomes our top priority. We grab our backpacks and hastily stuff them with essential items. Food, water, first aid kits, and maps. Non-essentials like camping chairs and extra clothes are left behind. We need to be as light and quick as possible. The forest now feels like a maze of potential dangers. Every sound and every movement puts us on high alert as we make our way through the tangle of trees and bushes. The morning light filtering through the canopy does little to ease the tension. We take the most direct route, based on Mark's GPS, though it means navigating through some rough terrain. We push through thickets, jump over fallen logs, and even cross a small stream. Every so often, one of us glances back, half expecting to see something lurking behind us. Finally, the spot where we park the car comes into view. It's both a relief and a new source of anxiety. The safety of the car is almost within reach, but we're not there yet, and what happened to our tents is a harsh reminder that we're not alone in these woods. When we finally get to the car, the relief is short-lived. Ben inserts the key into the ignition and turns it. Nothing happens. The engine doesn't even make a sound. You've got to be kidding me, Ben says as he slams his palm onto the steering wheel. Could you have left the lights on or drained the battery somehow? Morgan questions, her voice filled with concern and a hint of hope that this is just a minor oversight. Absolutely not. I double-checked everything before we left the car, Ben asserts. He steps out and lifts the hood to inspect the engine. A moment later, he lets out a gasp. You've got to see this. The wires are all messed up. It's like something chewed through them. Mark takes a look under the hood and his face goes pale. This is unreal. It's like something deliberately sabotaged us. His voice is shaky, barely above a whisper as if saying the words out loud makes the situation even more terrifying. That's it. We're definitely not alone and we're not safe here, I announce, looking at my friend's anxious faces. We need a new plan, fast. Okay, so what's our next move? 
Autumn asks, her eyes searching for answers. The nearest ranger station is about four miles away, I say, unfolding the map I had stuffed into my backpack earlier. It's our best chance for help, and it's reachable on foot. We don't have any other options, do we? Morgan says, her eyes meeting mine. No, we don't, I confirm, folding the map and putting it back into my bag. We need to move quickly, and we should stick together. Let's go. Our footsteps crunch over the forest floor as we set out. The ground beneath us is anything but smooth. We navigate over rocks and push through thickets of underbrush that tug at our clothes. I notice we're all frequently looking over our shoulders. There's an unmistakable feeling that eyes are on us, that we're not alone in these woods. Time stretches on, each minute feeling like an hour. Sounds that would normally go unnoticed. A twig snapping, leaves rustling in a faint breeze, now make our hearts race. Autumn breaks the silence. Her voice is so soft, it's almost drowned out by our hurried steps. We should have never ignored that journal, she says, the regret heavy in her tone. Morgan, a few steps ahead, turns her head slightly to acknowledge Autumn's comment. You're right, we should have taken it seriously. But we didn't, and all we can do now is get to that ranger station as quickly as possible. We lapse back into silence, our minds undoubtedly racing with thoughts of what might be lurking in the forest around us. The weight of our situation seems to grow heavier with each step, settling onto us like a thick blanket. Our eyes scan the area constantly, searching for any sign of movement, any indication that we're not imagining things. Then, just when a sliver of doubt begins to creep in, when I start to think that maybe, just maybe, we're letting our imaginations run wild, we hear it. A low growl rumbles through the air, echoing faintly between the trees. The noise is too intentional to be dismissed as just another forest sound. And the truly unsettling part is that it's happening in the middle of the day, dispelling any hopes that our unknown stalker is a creature of the night. We all stop in our tracks, eyes meeting in a shared moment of realization. There's no denying it now. Something is out there with us, watching, and perhaps even stalking us. The air feels thick with tension, our earlier skepticism replaced by a unanimous sense of dread. Morgan is the first to speak, her voice edged with a gravity we all feel. All right, let's pick up the pace. We're not safe, and the sooner we get to that ranger station, the better. With that, we continue our journey to the ranger station. Our pace is as brisk as the rough terrain allows, but every sound that filters through the trees now seems to carry a note of menace, quickening our steps and fueling the dread that hangs over us like a dark cloud. With our hearts pounding in our chests, we quicken our pace. Each step we take is filled with the urgency that fear provides. Every crunch of leaves and every snap of a twig sets our nerves on edge. It's as if the forest itself is conspiring against us. We are a united group, a team bound by the immediate need for safety, yet there's no mistaking the palpable sense of vulnerability that envelops us all. Our gazes are constantly shifting, darting to and fro as we scan our surroundings for any sign of the creature. Our minds are racing almost as fast as our feet. The feeling that we're running out of time intensifies with each passing second. We're in a race, but it's not just against time. We're also racing against an unknown creature lurking somewhere in the forest and against the dread that has settled deep into the pit of our stomachs. In the midst of this emotional and physical marathon, a sense of relief floods over us as we finally catch sight of our destination. The ranger station stands before us, a simple wooden structure that has never looked so inviting. It's as if we've found an oasis in a desert. Our steps become faster, almost desperate, as we close the distance. The ranger station is now within reach, its presence serving as a beacon, guiding us toward what we hope is a sanctuary. There is no room for doubt or hesitation now. We've come too far and endured too much to let anything stop us. All that matters is getting inside, locking the door, and alerting the authorities to our situation. We're almost there. As we approach the ranger station, 
it comes into clearer focus. The building is modest, with a small porch that has two rocking chairs, presumably for rangers to enjoy a moment's rest. The windows have curtains, currently closed, adding a homey touch to what is essentially a functional outpost in the wilderness. A flagpole stands to one side of the building, the American flag hanging limply in the still air. The front door is made of solid wood with a pane of glass at the top, showing a dark interior beyond. To the side of the door is a bulletin board filled with various notices, maps, and safety information for hikers. Beside the bulletin board, a metal rack holds brochures about the local plant and wildlife, hiking safety tips, and other useful information for visitors. The ground beneath us is a mix of dirt and gravel, crunching under our feet as we close the final few yards to the building. I notice a radio antenna protruding from the roof. The building itself has started to show its age. The paint is slightly chipped, and the wood is somewhat weathered. Above the door, a wooden sign displays the words Ranger Station in carved letters, painted in a forest green. Underneath, smaller letters announce the park's name. As we reach the porch, each of us takes a moment to catch our breath. We pause, standing in a small group, glancing back the way we came one final time. There's no sign of the creature, but that provides little comfort. We've learned the hard way that just because you can't see danger, that doesn't mean it isn't there. Finally, Ben steps forward and grasps the door handle. With a quick look back at all of us, as if to confirm that we're ready for whatever comes next, he turns it and pushes the door open. We enter the ranger station and our eyes immediately sweep the room for any people. But there's nobody. You've got to be kidding me. Mark says in frustration. I spot a wooden chair near the left wall, and I quickly take it to the door. Jamming the chairs back under the doorknob, I secure the entrance as best as I can. Search for anything useful, I say, directing the group. Ben is already dashing towards the phone sitting on a desk. He picks up the receiver and presses it to his ear, only to set it back down with a defeated look on his face. It's dead he announces. Autumn starts rummaging through desk drawers on the opposite side of the room. Her hands grasp a radio, which she hoists out and places on the desk next to the useless phone. What about this? Think it works? Morgan steps closer and inspects the radio. Her expression turns into one of cautious hope as she looks at Autumn. We've got to try, she asserts. We huddle around the desk, eyes locked on Autumn as she turns the knobs on the radio, maneuvering through a storm of static noise. My hands are clenched, silently willing the device to connect us with someone, anyone, who can help. At last, the static gives way to a faint human voice. Hello? Can anyone hear me? I ask, my voice tinged with desperation as I lean into the microphone. After a moment, a reply comes through the static. Yes, we hear you. Who is this? We're a group of campers, and we're stuck in a ranger station. We need immediate assistance, I say, my voice firm but anxious. The response is not what we want to hear. We won't be able to get to you until morning. Can you hold out? We have no choice, I answer briefly, cutting the connection. Switching to action, Mark starts to dig through a storage closet near the corner of the room. After a minute, he comes out holding a red box. This is all I could find, he says, revealing a collection of flares inside the box. Morgan grabs a flare, turns it over in her hands, and inspects it carefully. Better than nothing, she concludes. Night wraps the ranger station in an inky shroud. We've used chairs, tables, and whatever else is at hand to create a makeshift barricade near the door and windows. We're silent, our eyes meeting only to exchange nervous glances. It's as if the walls themselves are closing in. Then the air is cut by a guttural noise, a low growl that chills us to the core. There it is, Autumn whispers, her voice tinged with dread. We tighten our grips on the flares, our improvised weapons. 
Our hearts are pounding, and our ears strain for any additional sounds. Suddenly, a thunderous bang shakes the door. The chair I've wedged under the doorknob vibrates violently, but, thankfully, stays in place. The room is filled with the acrid scent of sweat and fear. The growl comes again, louder and more menacing. It's followed by another bang. This time the doorframe creaks and groans under the pressure. I can see in the eyes of my friends that we've reached the tipping point. We need to act. On my count, light the flares, I command, my voice steady despite the rising panic. One, two, three. In unison, we strike the flares to life. The room is instantly bathed in a pulsating red glow. We rush toward the door, our flares held high like torches. Pushing as one, we force the door open. And there it is. The creature. It's tall, standing on two legs, but its posture is hunched. Its skin is a mottled mix of grays and browns, resembling the texture of bark. The limbs are long and gnarled, ending in claw-like hands. Its face is the most jarring aspect. It has deep-set eyes that glint with a kind of hostile intelligence. The mouth is wide, filled with irregular, jagged teeth that look capable of inflicting serious damage. Despite its monstrous features, the unsettling part is its vaguely human-like appearance, as if it's some sort of twisted version of a person. It lets out a hiss, an unsettling sound that reverberates through the room. The creature recoils from the intense light of the flares, its eyes narrowing in what could only be described as disdain. It takes a step back, seeming to reconsider its next move. We hold our flares out in front of us, forming a line of defense. The creature hesitates, eyeing each of us as if calculating the risks. For a moment, time hangs in the balance. Finally, it turns, slowly retreating into the dark veil of the night, its growls fading into the distance. But even as it disappears from sight, we know it's still out there, lurking in the darkness, keeping us on edge. We let out a collective sigh of relief, but it's a short-lived victory. The immediate threat is gone, but the long night stretches ahead of us. We know we're not out of danger, not yet. The creature is still close. We turn our attention to fortifying our sanctuary, bracing for whatever comes next. We hold our flares high, the red glow illuminating the creature's face. It seems to hesitate, disoriented by the light. Seizing the moment, Morgan lunges forward and thrusts her flare toward it. The creature recoils, letting out a guttural cry that reverberates through the room. Without wasting another second, I kick the door shut and reposition the chair under the knob. The room is filled with a tense silence, punctuated only by our heavy breathing. Okay, we've got it back outside, I say, but we need to keep these flares handy. Ben takes charge of the radio again, attempting to get a stronger signal to communicate our urgent situation. After several frustrating minutes of static, he sighs and sets it down. It's just not working well enough, he admits. Autumn suggests we set up a schedule to keep watch throughout the night. We should have two people awake at all times, she says. We all agree, and quickly decide on shifts. As Mark and Morgan take the first watch, the rest of us try to catch some rest on the hard floor. But sleep is elusive. Every sound from outside jolts me awake, my hand instinctively reaching for the nearby flare. It's during my watch with Autumn that we hear it again, a scratchy, shuffling noise coming from the side of the building. We ready our flares, our eyes meeting in silent agreement that we're prepared to use them if necessary. The sound grows louder, culminating in a sudden thump against one of the windows. Both of us jump, but the window holds. What is it doing? Autumn whispers. It's testing us, testing the building, looking for weaknesses, I reply, my voice tinged with grim realization. The night drags on, each hour feeling longer than the last. We all take turns keeping watch, each shift punctuated by the creature's intermittent attempts to breach our sanctuary. It never comes as close as it did during that first encounter, but it remains nearby, reminding us of its presence with occasional growls and movements in the darkness. 
Finally, the first rays of morning light begin to filter through the windows. We look at each other, our faces drawn but relieved. It's not over, but we've made it through the night. Now we just have to hope that help arrives soon, as promised. Eventually, the sound of helicopter blades grows louder, punctuating the quiet of the early morning. Our eyes meet, relief washing over us like a tidal wave. The tension that held us captive all night begins to dissipate. It's finally over, Mark whispers, encapsulating what we're all feeling in that moment. As the helicopter touches down near the ranger station, a team of rescuers rush toward us. They look professional but puzzled as they scan the barricaded building and our haggard faces. You folks okay? One of them asks as he helps us into the helicopter. We nod, too emotionally drained for words. During the flight, we share our story with the rescue team and they listen intently. We've been covering this area for years, says one rescuer, and we've never heard of anything remotely like this. We'll make sure the area is thoroughly searched, another adds. You did the right thing by calling for help. As we ascend, I catch a final glimpse of the ranger station below. The helicopter takes us to a nearby medical facility for a checkup. The medical staff are kind, but ask questions that we find difficult to answer. We're physically okay, but mentally, the night's events have left scars that will take time to heal. While we're waiting for clearance to leave, one of the rescuers comes in to update us. We're conducting a full sweep of the area, he informs us. Nothing yet, but we're not taking any chances. He then hands us a set of keys. Your car has been retrieved. It's in the parking lot, repaired enough to get you home. We thank him, the magnitude of our ordeal making every small kindness feel like a lifeline. After some final paperwork, we're released. We walk to the car, the atmosphere heavy with unspoken thoughts. The engine starts and I feel myself releasing a breath I didn't know I was holding. As we drive away, the lingering question that haunts us is one that seems almost too terrifying to contemplate. What was that creature, and are there more like it lurking in the depths of the wilderness? The rescue team may never find anything, but the uncertainty remains, chilling us to our very core.